hear me? Okay. All right. And our next speaker is Andrew Sien, um, who is going beyond PUE, uh, telling us how to make our data centers more flexible. Andrew, take it away. Thank you, Simon. So you guys, can, can you hear me okay? So um, uh, this work uh, is uh, collaborative with uh, Sam Zong, uh, Peter Lin, and Varsha, who is here in the room, um, uh, who all are, are PhD students with me at the University of Chicago. Um, so the purpose of this talk is sort of in the vein of this hot series, um, not so much to communicate specific research results to you, but hopefully inspire you and get you excited about some of the new opportunities that this space represents. So if I've succeeded in getting at least one of you excited about this by the end of this talk, I'll be successful. Um, so uh, if you think about classic data center optimization, which has become deeply entrenched in our community, it's really around a couple of things. So first, you know, we assume that data centers, you know, are, are picked through a careful site selection process that might include, you know, being close to cities, high speed inter internet hookups, power, probably cheap, also nice if it's renewables land, water use, environment, these kinds of things. All these are basically static criteria that are used. Um, a second thing that is a canon of our community is total cost of ownership optimization. And you've probably seen 100 pie charts like this. Right? I think everyone has seen these kinds of pie charts. Um, and you know, it includes you know, both CapEx and OpEx, so things like you know, buying the compute, buying the buildings, but also operating, um, you know, power, uh, and all those kinds of things. IT staff, those are OpEx costs. But these charts are all based on average, like over a year, or over a five-year period, or something like that. And then most recently, there's a lot of excitement about this thing called power use efficiency, uh, where you know, we take into account power conversion efficiency, distribution of power, air movement, cooling, HVAC kinds of things, and so on. But we think of it PUE as almost one number that rests between compute power and data center power. And we even had our keynote speaker today talk about PUE like 1.1 as if it were a single number. It's a little more complicated than that, as we were thankful to the reviewers for pointing out that maybe we didn't communicate in the clearest way and we tried to improve it. So whoever you are, if, if at the end of the SIS we haven't done a better job, please, please come and tell us. Okay. But thank you to the reviewers. Um, so our position is PUE and TCO need to change. We need to think different because metrics often drive what it is you value and what it is you do. Okay, so you guys know carbon is important. I'm not going to reiterate that, but it's also highly variable. So I have two charts up here to emphasize the variability. This is the average carbon content of the KISO grid, the grid you're sitting in today. Um, and for the first time in the end of April and May, it reached 100% renewable generation. Hurrah, this is like a historic you know, milestone. It's KISO has been chasing for 25 years, right? Um, but you can imagine in the future, it's gonna be at zero a lot, and the ratio to average is much higher. So 250 at the peak, zero at the bottom, that's a pretty big swing, right? Um, it's not just daily, it's actually seasonal. So this is data from the ERCOT grid, four selected days, right? You can see the dates listed here. And you can see that depending on the season you're in, right? This is spring, this is fall. You might have very, very different profiles over the course of the day if you're not so lucky as to be in a grid or not in a grid that's solar dominated, right? Even the solar one varies over the year, but, but not quite in the same way. Okay, so, so what's the game here? The game is to move from static to dynamic, right? Because if you want to match when low carbon energy is available, you have to be doing something dynamic to match that dynamic variability. So here's a possible model for this. Think about this as, you know, if you're a, a financial speculator, you might have heard the, the slogan, buy low, sell high. Well, think of this as if you're a carbon speculator, you should use when the carbon is low and you should conserve when the carbon is high, right? That's the equivalent uh, argument. So here's uh, some charts from the German power grid in 2021 uh, that shows how the power price varies, that's red, or the carbon emission rate varied in the German grid, right, over a single day. And here's what the capacity of your data center might look like if you applied a simple rule, right? One rule to apply is constant carbon budget. Every hour I get to use as much power as corresponds to a particular carbon budget, right? Uh, so I increase capacity with this rule when power is low carbon, and I decrease capacity when it's high carbon. And on average, this is a weighted average, right? I will lower my average carbon, carbon emissions per, per unit compute. Um, if you do it for budget as well, you'll also get some variability as well. And you can imagine organizations that would prefer to do it on a money basis as well. But the point of this graph is also to show that doing it for carbon and for budget are not exactly the same. They won't come out the same. So, so this looks great, it gets very exciting, but if you're a data center designer and I showed you this graph, you'd have a heart attack. 
You could just say, oh my God, 500%. I, I could never afford to build that. They would kill me if I left 80% of that thing empty most of the time, right? That's how data center uh, infrastructure people think. So the challenges are that capacity limits the benefit you can get from this kind of a shifting scheme, right? And economics limits the capacity, and that's where TCO comes in, right? So this whole maxim of the infrastructure builder, right? And you've probably all heard this if you've ever talked to someone who worked in a cloud infrastructure. If I built it, I should use it. The goal is to fill it up after you built it all the time, right? Okay, so how do you get out of that game? So we've been thinking about this for a while, and we think actually there's a bunch of opportunities if you shift to a more dynamic view of these metrics. So traditional PUE, no, not exactly. If you read the data center book carefully, it doesn't say that there's one PUE number. In fact, it says the data center, strictly speaking, has a PUE that varies by the load level at each particular load point, right? But nobody reads that part. They just report one number, right? So actually what they're saying is most of the time, as you increase compute capacity, the amount of power you're expending in the compute sort of grows, right, in, in parallel lines, not quite parallel lines, you know, same ratio all the way up, uh, up to some 100%. And what we're proposing is that you'd like to have a data center that looks like this, that has headroom. So the headroom allows you to go from say 100 to 133% nominal capability, uh, and it's optimized for multiple operating points. So when you're on this side, you're operating in a high carbon situation, right? So you need to optimize for cost and, and power efficiency. But there's times when the grid is gonna be low carbon, maybe zero carbon, right? And it also turns out that a lot of times when the grid is close to zero carbon, it's really cheap power. In fact, we, we characterize a phenomenon called negative pricing, which is pervasive in a lot of these grids when there's a lot of renewables. Um, and then the CapEx is critical always. So we're thinking about a world in which as you further increase this power, maybe it's okay to let the PUE go up. Maybe it is okay to waste some power because you're operating in an almost zero carbon power state and you'll still be ahead on carbon efficiency. Okay, and so the idea here is operate here when low carbon or low price power is available. Okay, so how can you do that? These super smart engineers designed all this infrastructure and it must be the most efficient, it must be. Turns out it's not true. Turns out they optimize for a particular point of view driven by PUE and it isn't necessarily right that it gives the best sort of dynamic capability. So I'm just, I'm not gonna tell you how to solve this problem. That's like research for the next decade for the cloud industry. I'm gonna give you some ideas to suggest there might be a pony in this, right? So one idea is you could do turbo cooling in your data center. So what does turbo cooling mean? I turn up the airflow rate and I turn up the water flow rate, right? Which increases the heat carrying capacity of these systems, but decreases their energy efficiency. We've been driving it the other way for a long time, so we know this is true, right? So I'm saying go the other way a little bit, and that means we have greater heat cap capability. That means I can run the data center with higher total computing, but I'm gonna decrease the energy efficiency due to the efficiency of pumps, resistive losses, and so on. So it's not something for nothing, but it's something that is very cheap for us that we're paying. So that's one idea. Second idea, and this is gonna really make some people who design data centers perhaps angry, because one of the huge advances we had was high temperature data centers, right, over the last 20 years. So the high temperature data centers, the idea was, you could make the overall thing more energy efficient by operating your data center at a higher temperature. But what I'm gonna tell you is in order to get this headroom, what I wanna do is I wanna increase this temperature gradient by running the, 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 the coolant and running the air colder, right? Which again is the opposite of what they used to tell you to do. Uh, and the idea is this larger gradient by Fourier's law increases the rate of heat transfer, therefore increases the capacity of the system. Uh, and we're gonna have, decreased energy efficiency because our compressors are not gonna work quite as well. There's, 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 there's resistance in pumping through these pipes that have not gotten any larger, uh, and the HVAC. But I'm gonna get higher capacity for short periods of time when I can spend energy cheaply, right? Okay, and then of course there's this idea of seasonal headroom, which we mostly just ignore, but we know it's a reality, right? In Iowa, in the summer it's hotter than in the winter, probably by like 80 degrees, right? So why can't I run more capacity in the winter when I've got a larger temp temperature differential to outside, and likewise, if I'm doing evaporative cooling, if humidity is varying, I'm getting differential benefit, right, based on the energy, right, and also the amount of heat I can push out through that evaporative technique, depending on the humidity. So there's lots of opportunities. I'm not gonna claim these are the only ones. But these are in the flavor of increasing the power capacity without much increase in CapEx. I shouldn't have said without any increase in CapEx, because there's probably some, right? Okay, 
Now there's another idea too, which is we can go one level further. We can say, well, even inside the compute, there's these opportunities, right? So we all heard of turbo mode, right? So turbo mode is this mode in which it turns out Intel or AMD or something can build a processor where I can run it at a higher clock rate, burn a bunch more power, right? Because I've got dark silicon, I've got all of this extra hardware, but the problem is that eventually the processor will burn up, right? So in a traditional turbo mode, you'll run hot for a while and you don't have to shut down to some lower frequency, right? We don't understand that. But it turns out most processors can turbo indefinitely if, if you take the heat out of the package. That is, they've actually got a little thermal sensor in there. It's not a timer, it's a thermal sensor, right? So there's no fixed amount of time by which it has to turn off. It'll just keep running at high, at high clock rate. And if you go to your favorite gamer who's got a turbo cooler on their CPU, you can see this is possible. People will run for hours or days at these super high clock rates. So the idea here is that if I've got sufficient cooling in the system, I can increase my compute capacity, maybe without spending any capital expense, right? Which is critical to making this whole idea work. There's many more opportunities we believe, right? But this is just one direction in the hardware space um, that we wanna encourage people to think about and, and explore. Um, the software challenges, of course, are when to do this and how much to do this once you have this flexibility. Um, so some of the examples, if you open up this space for thinking about data center design, uh, you might think about what range of flexibility would you like to have, what kind of slopes of PUE are achievable, how to make it cost effective, of course. Um, you might be thinking if you're building a 200 megawatt or gigawatt facility, campus, right, they call it these days, what's the right granularity? Do you need to just take a couple of these pods and make them flexible? Do you want to make them all flexible a little bit or what? There are bunch of interesting questions there. Um, you might be thinking about customizing the flexibility designs for specific power grids. If you think about the economic trade-offs, it actually kind of depends on what the energy profile is for that particular grid, that particular power source that you're using, which might depend just on the grid, or you can change it by adding your own renewables to it locally, right? So it's an interesting set of design questions. Maybe there's a standard menu way of doing this where you can just slide it up and down depending on some, some standardized view. Um, and then there might be other novel approaches for creating flexibility. Immersion cooling is all the rage now, uh, but there's other things that you could think about. So that's the hardware side. Um, I got two more minutes left. Okay, let me talk about the software side. So we've been studying what would happen if you had these kinds of capabilities for a while in my group. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things that we discovered is that flexibility aware schedulers in a variable capacity environment can actually increase good put significantly. So good put is the measure of effective throughput. Um, if you consider a scheduler that just takes the fixed view uh, and you think about a scheduler that understands variability, a scheduler that understands visibility and has some forecast, maybe six hours forecast, uh, or a scheduler that understands variability and does some clever migration and adaptive things, you can make large gains in system good put. These numbers are huge, right? I mean, most data center operators would kill for a 5% increase. So if you're going into this variable world, you need new technology in this space. That's the message. So, so what are some of the interesting things uh, that you might like to have? You want accurate prediction of capacity. Whatever rules you're using to decide it, you'd like to know what it's gonna be. You'd like to capture workload properties over time, which isn't something that most data center workloads necessarily do. You'd like to know, how fast is this load gonna decay? How long does it last? And what my job mix is, right? Uh, you might wanna have new service models with temporal flexibility, SLO and performance and interruptibility. Um, and you might actually wanna have new ideas about how to make workloads reliable in the face of potentially remote capability. Uh, so some challenges, how do you decide what the data center power level is? You know, it can depend on all these things. How do you distribute whatever power changes you have at the data center level? to either the machines in the, in the data center or the applications in the data center or in the workload classes or however you want to think about partitioning this. As soon as it's changing, you've got to give that, you got to make somebody eat that. <laughs> you want me to think about it, right? Okay, uh, how do you coordinate power changes across data centers if I have a geographic? Suppose I'm not optimizing locally, I'm Google or I'm Amazon, I'm, Amazon, I'm local, optimizing across 10 data centers, right? In this region, in this country, in this continent, right? That's a different optimization problem. Uh, how do you exploit foresight, logistical planning, and other workload kinds of properties? You know, what are the role of these new service models? You know, serverless, everyone's excited about serverless, but it's not the only thing I'm sure. There's a whole range of things possibly that give us more flexibility. So we believe um, in this variable carbon world, if we're gonna optimize for carbon efficiency, 
that we need flexible data centers to be able to exploit the variable carbon and variable price too. You know, always nice if your, you know, ethical climate oriented optimization is aligned with making more money for the company. It makes it so much easier, right? Um, and PUE and TCO as traditionally defined are average metrics, they're static metrics, they don't have enough resolution. So we need a dynamic view. You know, maybe it's these things as a function of T or these things as a function of power level or something like that, right? Um, there's lots of data center design opportunities once you open up that box uh, and there's lots of cloud software management opportunities. So with that, um, you know, if folks are interested, uh, we've been thinking about this stuff for a while. This work is all new, but we've been thinking about this stuff for a while. And uh, there's two things that we would just point folks at. One is ZC Cloud site has a whole bunch of uh, information about power grids and, and some ideas for exploiting dynamism. But we recently have been working on building a carbon information service, um, not just one that would produce average carbon, but one that would produce some other kind of richer services uh, that would somehow be more useful for deciding how to organize your compute. So thanks to our research sponsors, NSF, VMware, Google Intel, and more. Um, and thanks to the reviewers who actually helped us hopefully make this more clear. Thanks, Andrew, for the inspiring talk. Run over here. Yeah. Um, so if I understand it correctly, like the, the trend among data center operators has been to sort of reduce the headroom, like their ability to overclock or their ability to over, over commit uh, any group of resources. And part of the reason for that is that it's more efficient if from an electrical perspective, you get more efficiency if you're if you run closer to sort of if if you overcommit essentially the, the the electrical resources among the, the systems that you have. So in order to be able to overclock sort of you know when power is free, um, presumably you're having to go in the other direction. That. So anyway, my question ends up being like presumably the implication of that is you're paying extra overhead during the periods when you're not carbon free to get extra capacity in that's times right. when you're carbon free. That's right. Is that all like it seems like that's actually a trade off not not so obvious that that's going to be a positive. Well, well, I think there's two parts of it. So it's a good point, right? So you have to be a little bit careful about the use of the term headroom because they're using it in a slightly different way. When we talk about headroom, we're talking about compute capacity increased its potential. Often when they talk about headroom, they're talking about some kind of a safety protection margin, right, for, for, for their system. But, but the, the, the parameters of what you're describing are, are basically, you know, something we should speak to. Um, I think the easiest low-hanging fruit is to find things that don't require much increase, right, in the CapEx, right, which is the TCO you pay for all the time. Um, and uh, uh, those things are going to be most obviously sort of the payoff, right? Um, now, um, the other thing that you can do is you can start in the regions that have most frequent periods or locations that have the most frequent periods of this zero carbon energy. And we did a whole bunch of studies and there are places that have 80 and 90% of the time, this kind of zero carbon energy, you just got to put your load in the right place, right? And, you know, I was talking to someone at lunch, there's some companies that are specializing in finding these places and basically providing these as services, mostly to the Bitcoin people, but they could also provide them to, to traditional data centers. Um, so, so I think that's right, um, but in the end, it is a trade-off, right? In the end, there's probably some amount of TCO that you're paying. And this is why, even though we proposed this for a while, um, a lot of the traditional data center folks, because of the metric lock that they have, they can't get past it because it looks just slightly higher on the TCO. They say, forget it, can't, can't get it, right? Well, if I could maybe follow up. So the, I mean, the keynote talk basically argued that the cost of carbon offsets for Google at the moment are such that they don't really have it's anything that increases costs they should just buy offsets for it like as opposed to just you know paying the extra cost so in order for this to really make sense presumably the cost of carbon needs to be higher well like i think if you're going to make optimizations that are going to end up costing more money as a consequence yeah so i i i think um yeah first i hope that uh all of the players in this space won't take so narrow a view that they're only going to do things that increase their profits. Um, but it's possible that some will, right? 
Um, I think it's true, actually, that if you look at some of the big players who have branded themselves as leaders in this space, the truth of the matter is most of that renewable energy that they bought was a lock-in for low price power to increase their profits. They'd like to tell you that their goal was to fund, right, the growth of renewables, right, and, you know, could be part of it, but in the end, they were getting this financial benefit. So I think that, I think that that's one of the challenges. One, can people do things that are not directly in their immediate commercial benefit? And there's good reason to believe that companies can do that sometimes. Um, but in the end, many of these things need increased carbon prices to really flourish, right? Because there's no, carbon has no price now, right? I can emit as much carbon as I want, right? And yeah, any other questions? Great That's question. one online, ah. actually. Uh, Romain, if you can unmute and ask a question. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Can you, you hear me hear fine? You. you can hear me. Um, hmm. All right, that worked oh. before, but now we can. you can hear me now? Now we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks Thanks a lot for the talk. I was just wondering. No, we're not hearing anything. can still not hear anything. Okay, that's kind of weird. I didn't change anything on my end. Can, can you hear me now or no? Still no? Did you unmute? I don't know. Can you hear me now? It should be on your end because I didn't. Uh, remain, change my we're end. still not hearing you. Can you mute? You didn't unmute. Yivo, can you try unmuting? I, I didn't change anything on my side, so. Not sure um, what's going on. Can someone just okay. paraphrase? I haven't heard the question, so okay. I cannot. Anyway, we're not sure what's going on, but. Okay. <laughs> please please can post you, it on, on yeah, Slack. Yeah, if you put it we'll, on Slack, we'll, we'll, we'll handle it there. It. Sorry. I'd be happy to talk. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank Andrew one more time. Oh. Thank you.